Amen. <laughs> How's that for a St. Patty's Day? <laughs> Thank you to the person who thought to marry uh, How Great Thou Art with uh, Danny Boy. That's beautiful. Anyway, happy St. Patty's Day to everyone. Hope you're enjoying it. Um, I have a friend whose daughter uh, years ago was attending Catholic school. She was in grade two. And as St. Patty's Day was approaching, the nun, the teacher of the grade two class, decided that she would give the kids a little lesson in patron saints. And so, you know, she went through the list. And those of us who were raised Catholic may remember that if we lost something, who did we pray to? St. Anthony, right? He's the patron saint of lost objects. Uh, musicians are to pray to St. Cecilia. St. Teresa of Avila is the patron saint of writers. Uh, I know St. Christopher was kind of demoted a while back, but he still is. He still is the saint and uh, the patron saint of travelers. And so the teacher asked the class if anyone knew what St. Patrick was the patron saint of. And of course, the answer is Ireland. But uh, there was this one little seven-year-old who was just so sure he had the right answer, who had his hand up. And when she called on him, he announced that he was the patron saint of green beer. <laughs> I'm sure the nun wondered where he got that idea. <laughs> I'm sure she found it perfectly adorable like we do. It's interesting to me that this is probably the most celebrated of all the Catholic saints' holidays, right? I mean, many non-Catholics uh, celebrate St. Patrick's Day after all. Corned beef, cabbage, green beer. I don't know, I never liked the look of that, but anyway, but you know, that's neither here nor there. You know, and yet, as celebrated as it is, not that much is known about St. Patrick. Much of his life is actually a mystery, and it's difficult to separate the facts from the legends that have been built up around him, uh, about him over the years. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of trivia. So I think it's good for you to leave here knowing a little bit more about St. Patty. Um, one, why do we wear green on St. Patrick's Day? Well, the color comes from, if you are aware, the Irish flag is a tricolor flag, green, white, and orange. And it, the colors are representing the two predominant faiths of Catholicism and Protestantism. Pro I have the hardest time saying Protestantism. <laughs> so <laughs> the green is for Catholicism. The orange is for Protestantism. And the white is for the intention for peaceful coexistence. Isn't that nice? So uh, St. Patrick was a Catholic saint. Therefore, uh, we picked the color green. The shamrock. It's alleged that when uh, St. Patrick was teaching uh, about Christianity and the principle of the Trinity that he used the three-leaf clover. Therefore, we get the symbol, the shamrock of the three-leaf clover. Banishing the snakes from Ireland. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Not, 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 never happened. It's pretty much accepted that Ireland never had snakes. <laughs> but <laughs> it's believed to be symbolic of the conversion uh, from paganism to Christianity. Now, I know when I first heard that about Patrick, you know, we're in a teaching where we like to honor everyone's path and say, you know, we're not about going and forcing our beliefs on someone else. So, you know, that might uh, be a little off-putting initially. But when we know more about the story, which you'll hear, uh, you'll realize it wasn't a forceful conversion. It actually was a teaching that when he taught about Christianity, people gravitated to it. And it was really his objective was to eliminate some very inhumane practices of paganism at that time. 
and to offer an alternative. So let's look at the story of Patrick himself, because in learning about him, uh, that actually inspired the theme of this talk for me, of finding and sharing the blessing. So Patrick wasn't even Irish. Did anyone know that? He was a Roman citizen born into a life of luxury in Britain and apparently was quite the rebellious lad, uh, you know, quite self-indulgent. And yet at the age of 16, he was kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery across the sea in Ireland. He endured about six years of really brutal conditions while watching over his master's flock of sheep. And during that time, in, during those trials of those six years, although he pretty much had been an atheist, didn't really have any sense of spirituality, he apparently heard the voice of God. He heard the voice of a presence that gave him faith. He eventually managed to escape and find his way back home to Britain. And he was welcomed with open arms. Everyone expected him to stay there. But see, during that time, during the hardships that he endured, and that experience of feeling that presence of God and hearing that voice, something in him had changed. And he felt called to go back to Ireland to bring a new way of life to the people. His mission, really, was to abolish slavery human sacrifice, and the bondage of Irish women. So it wasn't so much about my religion is the right religion, you have to convert. It was really from a place of seeing the suffering that some of these uh, traditions imposed on others, having experienced it, feeling it as something that was unnecessary, that shouldn't exist, and wanting to uh, offer an alternative to people. And apparently, um, when he was offering this option, when we was, he was talking about Christianity and uh, you know, giving up these kind of rituals um, that were so hurtful to others, he was coming from the heart. He was coming from a place of, you know, I've, I know what it is like to suffer and to experience these kinds of mistreatment. And that was very engaging, so it drew people in. It wasn't something that was forced upon others. In terms of this idea of finding and sharing the blessing, so, so much good came out of his negative experiences. He found the blessing in what he had gained from the experience, and then he had something to share with others to make life better for others, you know? And who knows how many of these facts are accurate or not, but in Science of Mind and other metaphysical teachings, we look at stories, whether they're from scripture or a story like this one of Patrick, and we look from the level of, okay, what do the characters and what do the themes of the story represent to me and my own growth in consciousness? And I think this story has a lot of significance for us today. You know, when life presents us with challenges, those dark night of the soul moments that we've probably experienced several times in our lives, maybe some of us are going through them right now, you know, it can really feel like we've been taken hostage by a situation, right? You know, we certainly didn't consciously choose it. We didn't consciously choose to go through that experience of severe illness, the financial challenge, the relationship conflict. We didn't wake up one morning and say, oh, it's Sunday, I want to go out and experience like real rejection and loss. <laughs> yeah, you know. But what we teach, what we emphasize over and over again in our teaching is that God is ever-present. God's nature may not be fully expressed, but it is ever-present in every moment, in every situation. It's the only true life, the only true power. The suffering that we experience is from a failure to recognize 
our oneness with God, to feel that connection to God's goodness, to recognizing that greater good in and around us than the human circumstance that we might be facing in this moment. And you know, it's really about knowing that it might be difficult right now. It may feel painful, but there's still a presence of God that's there for us to turn to. Patrick experienced that hearing the voice, that sense of connection with God in his darkest moments. You know, the negative experiences and the suffering we experience as a result of them causes us to go deeper, to tap into that divine nature that's greater than the situation, to tap into that courage, to tap into that sense of self-worth, to awaken to that sense of compassion for ourselves and for others, to you know, suddenly recognize that sense of abundance and generosity within us, to recognize the wholeness of our being. And as we tap into that nature, we find that it shows us the way out of our negativity. And as that happens, as we move through and beyond the challenge, we evolve in consciousness. We evolve in consciousness because we have come to know an aspect of God's nature at a deeper level. And now that growth allows us to be a blessing to others. We're able to now bring a higher level of consciousness into the world. Patrick opened up to the presence of God in his dark moments. He moved beyond the situation. He grew from that. And then he shared what he had gained from that experience. He shared the blessings that came out of that experience. He awakened to his sense of compassion. You know, he opened his heart to prevent the abuse, the mistreatment that he had experienced. And the blessing of opening his heart actually became the gift that he had to share with others. You know, I'd ask us to consider how much good has come to the world out of suffering and the desire to end it and to prevent others from having to endure it. You know, how many medical advances have been made out of our desire to not see the kind of suffering, the kind of physical ailments that we can experience in our human experience? You know, how many steps have been taken to try and ensure a greater sense of well-being of others, acceptance and tolerance you know, out of the suffering that has been experienced when that isn't being expressed. You know, we're very clear about something in this teaching. You know, in some traditions, there's this idea that because growth comes out of suffering, that somehow suffering is noble, that it's something that in the eyes of God, if we suffer, we're somehow more spiritual. No, we don't sign up for that, OK? We're not about promoting suffering. But you know, we, we emphasize that we thrive and we grow. We evolve in consciousness just as much from giving and receiving love, from being expressing our joy and taking in the joy that others have to share with us, you know, from the ways that we experience abundance and generosity. That, that helps us to experience and express that divine nature in us and, and come to know it in greater ways. But when suffering shows up, and I'm going to say when, I know this idea that uh, if we're on a spiritual path and we really do our spiritual work, we don't need to suffer anymore. I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> I really do. It does show up because we haven't fully awakened to our divine nature yet. We don't feel our oneness with God's nature all the time. And so where we don't, we will experience suffering. But when it does show up, when we experience it, we move through it, and we come out to the other side. We basically have two choices as to where to go from that point. We can hold on to our woundedness. Now, oh my god, I suffered so much. That was so unfair. And just keep focusing on that and how awful it was. Or 
we can recognize what we gained and what we now have to share as a result of that. So it's kind of, we have a choice of two basic mindsets. Bitter, party of one, <laughs> or better as a result of what I went through. Better in the sense of now I can understand and be more respectful, be more compassionate, be more generous. Which one of those two individuals would you like to see show up at your Gourmets for God event? <laughs> just, just a question. <laughs> you know, Reverend Patrick Harbula, uh, author of Magic of the Soul, and um, a dear friend who's been a spiritual coach to me for many years, he, um, he's talked to me about often he will coach people in helping them to identify what their deeper life purpose is, what their mission is in life, what really, what they want to bring to the world in this lifetime. And he said very often, I mean, it's just not uncommon to discover that that purpose comes out of some difficulty or trauma they endured but moved through. But now they want to either help prevent others from suffering in that way or be there to support those who are going through the kind of suffering that they've endured. He speaks about his own case in his situation as a you know, uh, kid, an adolescent. He really felt that his father didn't value him for the individual that his, he was. He really felt like his father wished his son had been different from the way he was. Now, later in life, he realized that probably wasn't accurate, but having felt that for a long time, he knew what it was like to not be appreciated for his uniqueness. He knew what that felt like when that sense of value and a sense of appreciation isn't expressed. As a result, he said one of his greatest gifts, and it comes so naturally to him, is to absolutely value others, encourage them to be you know, that unique gift to the world that they were meant to be, not to buy into having to be someone different. That was the blessing that he got out of that experience and could share. You know, how many advances in social justice and equality have come out of human suffering, rising above it, feeling that it's wrong, you know, trying to you know, end that kind of thinking and to prevent others from having to endure it. There was a congregant uh, in our church recently that shared with me that she was so deeply moved and inspired when a friend of hers who uh, had to face his own imminent mortality as he was dying from complications with AIDS, that in facing that over the last few months of his life, his heart softened. He just became a gentle and loving and probably a kinder person than she'd ever seen him. And what a lesson that was to her. I mean, obviously, it was a blessing to him to be able to open up to more love in that way, but also to her just by witnessing that, to see how you know we are not confined by our circumstances, that there's still this potential in us that's always there to be revealed. For myself, in my 30s, I had the opportunity to be with several friends and loved ones at the time that they were passing on to be at their bedside. And I can tell you, it was excruciatingly, excruciatingly painful. You know, I just remember feeling a pain in my heart like nothing I could really describe. And yet, what I can tell you is that in the anguish, something happened where my heart just cracked open and a sense of it doesn't end here, a sense of we're still connected, there's a way that we'll be connected throughout eternity, came through that absolutely was such a blessing to me. You know, it 
it completely dissolved my fear of dying or being around death. It allowed me to be able to be with people when they're facing that time of life, which we all get to do at some point. But it's not comfortable for a lot of people. I know that even if it's just to sit there and be a presence of knowing everything is OK, it's OK, that I can do that. The blessing of that, out of that excruciating pain, what I got out of it, has given me a gift that I am able to share. Now, I'll tell you, if there's a sign-up sheet somewhere for excruciatingly painful experiences that will open you up to more of God's goodness, I'm not signing up. <laughs> no. No, I don't think we, we have to seek suffering. We don't need to seek it out. But I think it's helpful for us to be aware of the good we've gained through life's challenges. And the benefits are on several levels. I think, first of all, by looking, you know, by looking back to find the gift that we got out of a difficult situation in life, it helps to emphasize deep in our subconscious that there was a greater good that was there to be revealed through the difficult situation. It helps us to have a greater sense of that goodness being ever present. And as we say in Science of Mind, the more we sense that inner potential of God's goodness through everything we go through in life, the more we're going to call it forth, the more we're going to be open to it, no matter what our circumstances. And I think it also helps us to release any residual sense of woundedness or pain that may come up when we reflect back on those situations. Wouldn't it be nice to be free of that so we can move forward? And so I think the greatest way to develop that is to really look for the blessing we've gained from moving through a challenge and give thanks for it. Be grateful for it. You know, I would ask us, is there anything that we can look back on that we might still be holding on, you know, is feeling so bad that this has happened to us that we can look back and say, you know what, here's how I grew from that. So I did grow from that. I can put it down. I can move forward. Because that will help us to have that greater sense of being able to do that with any of the challenges we're facing right now. So I say, let's look back at those situations and say, in my case, I would say, I give thanks. I absolutely give thanks for that greater sense of eternal life and being connected to loved ones throughout all eternity. I give thanks for that blessing. I give thanks for the greater compassion, the greater courage, the greater sense of self-worth, the greater faith, the greater whatever aspect of God's nature that I've come to know better, that I gained. So I'd ask us, what blessings have we gained from our life challenges that we might want to acknowledge so the memories of them no longer weigh us down? I say, let's honor how those blessings opened us up to more of God's nature, which has enabled us to bring forth a greater sense of that aspect of God's nature into the world. And let's celebrate that. In Ireland, the uh, traditional greeting that we often hear is the top of the morning to you, and the response is, and the rest of the day to you. <laughs> In closing, I would like to offer to you the top of the morning to you as well as the rest of the day, the rest of your life, to you with all its ups and downs, its twists and turns. May each moment reveal more and more of God's light within you, so you can delight in being who you are as a unique expression of God, and you can experience blessing and share the blessing of who you are with us in ever expansive ways. Let's pray. Thank you. Thank you. So as we turn our attention inward, that is just absolutely feel that presence within us, that presence that always seeks the greater experience, the greater expression, 
greater knowingness of itself as love, as joy, as wholeness, as abundance, as every form of goodness. Let us recognize that as the essence of God's nature out of which everything is created and that lives through and as all that is, including each and every one of us gathered here today. I speak my word for us all, knowing absolutely that every situation in life, whether it has been something we see as wonderful or a challenge, has been there to help us to align with, to recognize, to know that nature of the divine at a deeper level. And so if there's any area where we currently are feeling separate from God, let us right here, right now, open to remembering that that, that aspect of God's nature is present right at the center of our being. Our desire to experience it more is coming out of its presence in us, seeking a greater expression of itself. And as we do, we find the way to align with it and to experience it more fully. We let this prayer be a prayer for loved ones, for situations in the world that call to our attention. I know we're absolutely blessed by being here together. And the more we realize how blessed we are, the more blessings we have to share with others. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And with a full and grateful, grateful heart, I release this word, knowing it is so. I let it be, and so it is. And together we say, Amen. Amen.